the same. Zikaria, you've been to have a child. Zikaria, even though you and your wife are beyond the age of having a child, you've been to have a child. But to my surprise, Zikaria being a priest, and the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, he was a priest that was chosen by the people to go into the presence of God. But then, he asks the angel, how is this going to be? That actually surprised me. And the Lord started to show me something. And even while I was worshipping, it started to hit me. Because what Zechariah did is actually what is going on today. But then we don't notice it and we keep living. Because, okay, Zechariah is a priest. And I believe Zechariah knows the story of Abraham and Sarah. And he knows the story of Hannah. If he knows the story of Abraham and Sarah, 25 years of barrenness, and they tell him he's going to have a child by Angel Gabriel and Ash Angel, and he still doubts, it means there's something somewhere, there's something wrong somewhere. How can you know the God that gave 25 years barrenness and solved it to, for somebody, for Abraham, and you're a priest, you preach it every day, but then when it comes to your own case, you ask the angel, how is this going to be? As I was sitting down there, it was actually hitting me. Like, I think like three weeks ago, Sister Nahafa shared about the seven characteristics we are supposed to have as a child. Yeah, I was asking myself, how many of us have actually sat down, taken those seven things, cross-checked with our lives, and actually made changes? How many of us listen to the word of God and it just passes like the career? Because he's a priest. He used to preach it, but then an angel appeared to him, and then he just, how is this going to be? Actually, that's why the angel got angry. And so I'm actually, when you listen to the word of God, do you just listen? Because I'm thinking like, God does not just want his word to be like the news. You just listen to the news and you just go back home. I like us to bow down our heads. For example, I think two months ago I talked about the Holy Spirit and how we should be in close contact with Him. How many of us actually have a close relationship with the Holy Spirit? How many of us actually discuss with Him? How many of us have increased our prayer time? How many of us have increased the number of chapters we read per day for the past two months? I'd like us to just bow down our heads and say, Oh God, I'm sorry. I don't want a spiritual life that is up and down. I don't want to be like Zechariah. I don't want to just listen to the word of God and just go back home and then it's just like I listen to the news. Let's talk to God. Tell God, I want to listen to the word of God like it's the word of God. In those days, people used to call the name of Jesus and others would stand up from the, from the rich here. Nowadays, we just listen to the word of God. Just bow down and say, Oh God, I want to listen to your word with a difference. <sighs> A difference, oh Lord, a difference, a difference, a difference, a difference. I don't want to be like Zechariah who just knew all the testimonies in the Bible, who was a priest. And in his situation, he couldn't apply it. Oh God, please, your word, your word. I want to receive it like never before. In the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. King of kings and Lord of lords, let your glory be seen. Let your power take over and speak and let no man speak. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I pray that as you listen to the word of God, you won't be like Zechariah in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we turn our Bibles to Luke chapter 1, verse 11 to 17? Yeah. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 to 17. Then an angel appeared to him, standing on the right side of him altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. 
But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. To 16, right? 17. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Amen. What God says about greatness? What God says about greatness? What God says about greatness? I'm going to say doing a fellowship with you. Studying this, and then by God's grace, I had the opportunity to share, and then I wanted to share something else with you. It's like the Holy Spirit wants us to be blessed with what we shared on Wednesday. So open your hearts and be blessed. What God says about greatness. How great is this man John the Baptist? I actually ask myself, who is the greatest man that has ever existed? If you look at Luke chapter 7 verse 28, Christ's disciples walked up to him and they were like, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Baptist. Luke 7, 28. I like you to write it down. And then Christ was like, Out of all men born by women, there is none on earth greater than John the Baptist. And then I'm asking myself, what about Elijah? Somebody that rode a chariot of fire to heaven. What about David? What about Isaiah, Jeremiah? Those people that perform miracles. Those people that shook the earth. What about them? But then Christ said, out of every man who has been born on earth, the greatest that has ever existed, apart from me, Christ, is John the Baptist. How great is John the Baptist? How great is John the Baptist? He was prophesied. The prophecy about John the Baptist came through the Archangel Gabriel. Now look at this. Angel Gabriel is an Archangel. He's like the PA, the personal assistant of God. He's the one that stands beside God in heaven. He's the one that operates the multi-dimensional purposes of God. Yeah, but then he came to prophesy the coming of John the Baptist. How great is this man, John the Baptist? How great is John the Baptist? How great is he? John Gengebo was mentioned only three times in scripture. Number one, when he was talking to Daniel, the expression explaining the revelation. Number two, when he was prophesied about John the Baptist and when he was prophesied about the coming of Jesus Christ to the Virgin Mary. How great is this man John the Baptist? I'd like us to look at what made Jesus say John the Baptist is the greatest among men that have existed. And what made Angel Gabriel to say this man is going to be great, he's going to impact lives, he's going to be great. Yeah, but first, before we talk about greatness, I like us to give you. I like to give you two things that greatness is not, so that you know what we are not talking about. After that, I'll give you two things that greatness is. Now let's talk about. Can someone read Matthew, Matthew chapter three, verse four to five? I'll show you something. Two things greatness is not. Matthew three four to five. Yes. Mark, sorry. Get it? Three, chapter three. Oh, Matthew chapter three. Matthew chapter three. Uh -huh. Verse four to five. Mark or Matthew? Matthew chapter three, verse four to five. Okay, Matthew 3, 4 to 5. And John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan 
went out to him. Amen. Amen. Now, I'd like you to look at something. John the Baptist is the greatest man on earth that has existed. But what did he wear? He put on camel's hair. That's the first thing I'd like you to see. And he ate wild honey and locusts. People of God, I'd like you to look at something. Nobody eats wild honey and locusts if he's hungry and has an option. If you're eating wild honey and locusts, because you have no choice. Because he left in the wilderness. That's where he lived. He lived in the wilderness. That's a great man. He's a great man. And then I began to ask myself, this greatness that Christ saw in John the Baptist, is it about materialism? Is it about what you possess? Is it about, about what you wear? Is it about what you eat? What greatness is Christ talking about? And then I began to look at the life of John the Baptist and I discovered none of these things applied in that great man's life. It's not about materialism. It's not about what you eat. It's not about what you wear. It's not about what you study. John the Baptist did not go to school. He went to the wilderness. The Bible says he grew up in the wilderness. It's not about what you study. It's not about what you eat. He ate honey. And no cause. I'm even sure they were not cooked. But then, <laughs> it's not about what you eat and what you wear. He wore camel and tied the leather belt around his waist. Now, look at this. I've always made this analogy. If, if an angel were to appear to you and say, you're going to have a great soul, the first thing that will come to your mind is materialism. Mm -hmm. Is that he's going to have big companies. He's going to be a multi-international businessman. That's what we think about. But then I want to delete this idea from your mind. I want you to know that empty we came to earth, empty we are living. Now look at this. I made this analogy. If Christ comes to church, after studying my Bible, I discovered Christ will not look at the choir. Christ will not look at the prayer band. Christ will not sit down to look at the preacher man. Christ will not sit down to look at the instrumentalist. Christ will sit down to look at the offering basket. Because if I read my Bible, okay, let's go to Mark. Mark 12, verse 41 to 44. It talks of Christ sitting in church. Because Christ used to go to church. It was a custom for him. If you read the book of Luke, you describe it as a custom. And then in Mark 12, chapter 41 to 44, just write it down. He went to church and he sat down at the side of the offering basket. And the Bible said he watched. Now, what was he watching? He was watching the offering basket. There was choir singing and dancing. There was instrumentally singing, but then he didn't watch them. The whole Bible, Christ did not, they, they did not say he was watching this, he was watching that. He was watching the offering basket. And what happened? A poor widow came out and dropped two turns. And then he said, this woman has given more than everybody. Now, what I want you to see is that Christ was concentrated on the offering basket. Now, let's look at it this way. The more you put in that offering basket shows how much you love God. That's the first thing. And the more you put in that offering basket shows how less or how minimal you look at this materialism we are talking about. You understand me? So this is the connection I want to make. Greatness is not about materialism. And this materialism we are talking about can only be overcome by how much you put in that offering basket. How much do you sacrifice for God? How much do you offer to God? Because Christ, I'm actually thinking, if you say, okay, greatness is not about materialism, and Christ is concerned about what you're putting in that offering basket, how much can you release? Okay, this is it. Giving is not about what you give. Because even though she gave the lowest, but Christ was happy with her. Giving is about two things. Number one, how much do you have left after giving and how much is it compared to your capacity God has blessed you with? You understand? So I'm asking myself, the woman that placed inside that offering basket, how did she give? She gave all she had. First, it shows me two things. She shows me her love for God and it shows me her disregard for materialism and possessions. If you have that disregard for materialism and possession, then you can join me to see what greatness is about. I just want you to picture me. What is greatness in the eyes of God? It's not about materialism. It's not about book. It's not about studies. It's not about what you're studying or what you're going to eat or what you're going to make in the future. It's not about materialism. Now, let's look at it. What is greatness not about? The second point. 
John 10 41. Can we please? John 10 41. John 10 41. Then many came to him and said, John, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about these men were true. John performed no sign. John performed no sign. John performed no sign. And that version says, John performed no miracles, no signs and wonders, no miracles. Greatness in the eyes of God is not the manifestation of the power of God. That's what I want you to see. John performed no miracle. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that you can speak in tongues for six hours does not mean in God's eyes you are a great man. The fact that you can pray for a brother that is sick, the fact that you can lay hands on the sick and the jump of waxing strong does not mean you are on the track of greatness in the eyes of God. The fact that you can dream dreams, see visions, prophesy, does not mean you are on the track of the greatness of God. Number one, materialism. Number two, gifts. The gifts of God. For example, the gifts of righteousness that God has given us is irreversible. But it does not mean you are going to heaven. Okay. The gifts of righteousness that God has given us is like a school uniform. So, giving your life to Christ is registration into the school. And it gives you a gift. The school uniform. Righteousness. When you put on that school uniform, it doesn't mean you're going to graduate. It just gives you the legalization to go to school. It does not mean you're going to graduate. That's what I want us to understand. The gifts of God are not the... It's not a demonstration of, the, of His greatness. Of the greatness that He's seen in us. For example, look at... If you read Judge chapter 16, Samson will sleep with a prostitute. After sleeping with a prostitute, the Holy Spirit will come into him and he will fight against the Philistines. Now, if you were to look at the manifestation of the power of the Holy Ghost in Samson's life, I bet you're going to say, This man is a great man of God. This man, but then Samson prayed only once in his life, and he was about to die. And he wasn't even praying because of God. He was praying because he wanted to tell God, God is for our movement. I let me revenge. But then, if you were to look at the great works, Samson will sleep with the adults. As soon as he wakes up, he will bring down gates, he will bring down powers, he will kill thousand soldiers with the job of our hands. But then, if you look at the gifts, you will say, This man is a man of God. But then, the manifestations of the power of God are by his mercy and not it does not mean you're on the right track it does not mean you're on that track of greatness in his eyes now, Numbers chapter 22 23, 24, 25 you can read that at home but then let's read 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 14, 16 Balaam, Balaam Balaam and Balak Balaam is one of the awesome prophets Second Peter 2, two 14, 14 and or 2, 16. 14 to 16. Okay. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, they have the heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. They are forsaking the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. Amen. Now, if you read Numbers 22, 23, 24, you're going to see the story of Balaam. I think that was one of the first prophets that prophesied about the coming of Christ. Now, what happened? There were the Moabites, Balak was the king of the Moabites at that time. The Israelites were going to the promised land, but then they were passing through the land of the Moabites. They were passing through Moab. Then Balak discovered that these people are so massive. If we, we try to resist, they are passing through a land, they are going to conquer us. Therefore, he sent for the prophet Balak. Balak was an anointed, blessed prophet of the Most High God. So he sent for Balak and said, Balak, I'd like you to curse these people. After cursing them, so that we can fight against them and conquer them so that they will not pass through our life. Now, what happened? Balaam told him, even if you give me your position, I will not curse somebody that God has not cursed. And 
Yes, he sent his messengers. But then the messengers went back to Barak. And Barak said, no, it's like this man is not understanding the situation. I'll send princes and I'll send people that are high in position. Let them go and see Balaam again. And then Balaam now went. And then when they went to Balaam, Balaam said, Okay, wait, let me pray to God and ask. Ha! Ah, but God had already spoken. God had already said, No, don't bless, don't curse who I have blessed. Don't bless, don't curse the Israelites because the Israelites are my people. God had already spoken. Why are you coming back to God to ask again? He came and asked. And then the Lord said, I am not in agreement with what you are doing. Okay, go. But when you go, do only what I ask you to do. On his way, an angel stood on the way with a sword and actually made the donkey to talk to him. Now don't go where you are going. God is not in agreement with this. Balaam still went. Why? Because they had promised him a big position. They had promised him money. That's the prophet of God. He went and on the... On the, he went and when he went met Balaam, he prophesied four major prophecies in the Bible. The full prophecy was about Jesus Christ. But then he was in a disobedient mission to God Almighty. And he was prophesying. I'm trying to make you to see that the gifts and manifestation of the Holy Ghost in our lives are by mercy. And it does not mean you are on the right track of greatness in the eyes of God. Balaam was a mighty prophet. He disobeyed God and he moved in the way God did not want him to move. But then he still manifested the gifts of prophecy and even prophesied about Jesus Christ alone. I want you to see this. Don't be deceived by the gifts you see. Don't be deceived by the tongues you speak. Check your life. Check. Check. Check your life. Check. Check your life. Check your life. I want us to see that the gifts and manifestations of God in our life do not actually mean they do not mean greatness in the eyes of God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Okay. What did I see in the life of John the Baptist? What did I see in his life? Can we read Mark chapter 3 verse 3 to 6 again? I saw something about the wilderness. Yes. Mark 3. Three to six. Yes, we've read that already, but I want you to read it again. We'll see something else. Okay. I think it's Mark 2. Mark 3. Yeah. Then he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward, and he said to yes, them, Yes, read Matthew. Matthew, read 3 to 6. I think I have it here. Mark, Matthew 3, 3 to 6. For this is he who has who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. In the wilderness. In the wilderness. It's okay. I want, I want us to look at something. Before I tell you about... Okay, I saw this when I was... I saw this and I just wrote it up. I said, I'm going to share it. The wilderness. John the Baptist grew up in the wilderness. He grew up in the wilderness. This is somebody, when he was born, people gathered. When he was growing up, I'm sure his dad used to tell him, you know son, when you were born, before you were born, I saw an ash angel and he said you're going to be great, you're going to be a mighty man. That's how John the Baptist grew up. But then, I believe he looked at his life at a particular point and he cried unto God, God, where is the greatness? Look at me in the wilderness. Which greatness, which happiness will I bring to my father as you said? What happiness? Where is the greatness? Look at my life. Look at the wilderness. Then I want you to look at this. The wilderness you are in now does not mean God has abandoned you. Amen. The wilderness you are going through now is just a preparation for your promised land. Amen. The Israelites were in the wilderness for 40 years. For 40 years. But then they still went to the promised land. The wilderness you are going through now it only means the best is yet to come. Amen. He was in the wilderness, but then the best is yet to come. Okay, let me show you something. In fact, I like God because when you think everything is over, when you think you're in the wilderness, that is when God steps in and then he shows you a dangerous manifestation of his dimensional power. Okay, look at this. Abraham and Sarah, they were there for many years, 25 years. And what is the gift that God gave unto them? 
He gave them the land of Israel. God gave them a multi-dimensional generation. A generation that is still popular. A generation that brought forth their Savior. Sarah waited on God. And what did she receive? She received what? Samuel. Elizabeth waited on God. And what did she receive? She received John the Baptist. I'd like you to see something. Those who have waited on God, at the end, God always gives them a multi-dimensional blessing. A blessing that is uncommon. Okay, if you open your Bible to Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 7. Luke 5, 1 to 7. I'll just read something before we go to the next one. Luke 5, 1 to 7. seven. Now, so it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitude from the boat. Now when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. Amen. Amen. Okay. When I saw this, I began to jump. I was saying, God, you are wonderful. If you look at this story, it tells you something. The fishermen had been fishing the whole night, and they had been praying. Oh God, what is going on? Which kind of hunger is this? How come we are fishing? Nothing is happening. But then, as soon as Christ stepped in, and Christ said, dip your net into the waters, they began to fill two boats, and the net began to break. Because they thought, the wilderness you are going through, by the time Jesus Christ shows up in your life, by the time God shows up in your life, there is a multi-dimensional experience you are about to experience. God is going to make it a multi-dimensional experience. And we after that, you are not going to forget. I like to encourage somebody today. The wilderness you are going through. Abraham went through it. Hannah went through it. Elizabeth went through it. The Peter, Peter and his brothers they went through it when they were fishing. And when Jesus Christ showed up, their nets began to break. I begin to prophesy upon your life, sir. And I tell you, don't worry. As soon as Christ shows up in your life, your nets will begin to break. In the name of Jesus. Be patient, my brother. Be patient, my sister. When Christ shows up, it feels like he's disappointed you. But when he shows up in your life, there will be a difference that is different from those around you. Amen. Be patient. Amen. Christ will show up. Amen. It's just a wilderness. Does not mean the promised land is not still there. In the name of Jesus. Amen. What did I see in the life of John the Baptist that made me to, to be happy? What that made me to say, this is what Christ saw. If you look, at Luke chapter 1, verse 11, 17, when we read from the beginning, it talks about John the Baptist having the Holy Spirit in him. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in him. That was before Pentecost. So this is one of the people that had a pre-Pentecostal experience. Somebody that experienced the Holy Ghost before the Holy Ghost came to earth. John the Baptist, this is one of the people that experienced the Holy Ghost before the Holy Ghost came to earth. The Holy Spirit. Sometimes I look at my life and I ask, I was actually asking myself during worship today, which kind of Holy Spirit do I have? Which one? Is it the same Holy Spirit that came on Pentecost and people were speaking in tongues and raising the dead and breaking out of prison? Which kind of Holy Spirit do we have? Ask yourself that question. Is it the same Holy Ghost? Is it the same Bible that I'm reading that Paul read? Is it the same Holy Ghost that Peter had? The Holy Ghost. Is it the same Holy Ghost that raised the dead? Is it the same Holy Ghost that made people to preach for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and 3,000 people gave their lives to Christ? Which Holy Ghost do we have? Which Holy Ghost do we have? Which Holy Spirit do we have in us? I was, I was reading about a revival, 1969 to 19 to about 2000 was a revival in Nigeria. One of the people that got that revival was Apostle Joseph Babalola. This man was filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, he was preaching back to back, crusades everywhere, blessing people. But then people were complaining that we come to your house, we don't see you. We come to your house, we don't see you. What is going on? What is going on? He said, I need time to pray. Therefore, he went. There was a river, like let's say Volga, behind his house. 
He went there and he, he touched the water. And he said, by the power of the Holy Ghost, by the power of the Holy Ghost, I pray upon this water. Anybody that fetches water from here will be healed. Today that river is no more there. People fetch the river dry. <laughs> as soon as you fetch the river, you drink it, kill it. People will bring 600 liters and tell them. I'm telling you. But then that's the demonstration of the Holy Ghost. So I don't want you to see it like the Holy Ghost was just in the life of Paul, in the life of Peter, in the life of those that received it at first sight. But then the Holy Ghost, it's the same Holy Ghost in us. What is going on? That's somebody, Apostle Joseph, he was standing at the altar, he was worshiping in the spirit. The basman was there playing. Verse when he saw Baba Lola, Baba Lola was going up, he was saying, good, good. And he was looking, the man was going up. He was saying, Baba, Baba don't go, Baba don't go. The man was rapturing. Holy Ghost. And then he looked up and he said, not time, my Lord, not time. And then he came down. Holy Ghost. Which Holy Ghost do we have? He stood on the altar and then there was a burning and corruption in the church. He said he cannot accept it. He cannot accept it. He stood on the altar and he said, You, 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 you're committing baby and corruption. And if I don't say it, I am not with I am with you. Therefore, I say it, you're committing baby and corruption. And then the people started saying, You are a fake man. What you're saying is it's a lie. And then he lifted up his hands and he said, Holy Ghost! If I am your servant, if I am that friend you say I am, let there be a let there be a demonstration of power and the earth opened in two, divided in two, in church, on the altar, broke into two, in Nigeria, separated him from those who were like, the earth broke into two. That's the same Holy Ghost we have. Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. The man used to have crusades. 300 people, deaf and dumb, seen. The blind, seen. The lame, jumping. Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Holy Ghost. That Holy Ghost that was in the Bible. He continues to function today. But what is going on with that? Is it? John G. Lee is one of the people when I read his testimony, I begin to jump in the room. I begin to say, oh God, this is what I want. He had the multi, a big ministry. And then he began to preach and gather thousands and millions of people. But then the government began to get jealous and they drove him out of town. He said, since you are chewing me out of my hometown, I will go out of town on my father's grave. He stood on his father's grave and people began to gather. Began to gather. Millions of people gathered around the grave in the outside. And then they were asking him, what is your secret? He said, I have the fire in me and I burn the fire by the Holy Ghost. And then people come to see me burning. The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Which Holy Ghost do we have? Is it the same Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost. I'd like to soak up your desire for God to be. I'd like to quicken it. The Holy Ghost. The people won't discuss with the Holy Ghost. They discuss with Him. Audibly. 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 The same Holy Ghost. I'd like to check your life. Check. 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 Holy Ghost. The same Holy Ghost? Which kind of Holy Ghost do you have? Is it the same that is doing all these things I'm talking about? Is it the same? I'd like you to check the Holy Ghost. No, but something I discovered in the life of John the Baptist was John the Baptist knew his purpose. Can you read John chapter 1? John chapter 1 verse 23 for me. Just talk about that, they will pray. John 1, 23, yes, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Yes, that was 22. So we can start once Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Amen. Who are you? What are you doing here? Why did you come to earth? What have you done since you came? What are you going to do before you die? If somebody just came to you and asked all these questions, what will you say? Who are you? And you say your name, right? Eh? I'm France. What did you come to do on earth? Eh, I came to school and then I have a job and then I die and go. <laughs> Who are you? What if you were asked to answer that question? What will you say? John the Baptist was asked. And what did he say? 
I am the voice of one that cried out from the desert. Who are you? What is your purpose? Do you have a purpose? Do you have a purpose? Did you just come here to go to school, have your degree, get a job, get married, have kids, then die, and go? Then what is the difference? What is the difference? Who are you? What is your purpose? You would never have a picture of greatness in the eyes of God till you can accomplish your purpose for which you came here. And you can't accomplish a purpose you don't know. If you cannot answer that question, who are you? That's the question that was asked to John the Baptist. Who are you? What is your purpose? And he said, I am the voice of one that cried out from the desert. He knew he was here to prepare the path for John for Christ. That's why he spent all his life saying, the one that is coming, I am not even worthy to untie his sandals. He knew his purpose. And he accomplished his purpose. And Christ said, on earth, there is no one born of a woman that is greater than John the Baptist. Because he knew his purpose. Who are you? What is your purpose? Why did you come to earth? Why did you come to earth? I was actually discussing with a friend some time ago and I was asking, what are you going to do after school? The person told me, I don't know. I'll just write an entrance exam by God's grace, I'll do a master's degree. And so what? <laughs> I don't know. And after that, what will you do? I don't know. Huh? Maybe I'll get married. I don't know. Who are you? What are you doing here? If you ask that question, what are you, there are three places you would have been. In heaven, on earth, or in hell. <laughs> what are you doing on earth? In fact, sometimes I tell you about God, I just meet some people on earth and go to hell. Go, go, go. Because you're doing nothing here. What are you doing here? Go, 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 go. <laughs> what is your purpose? Why are you here? Who are you? Who are you? You can only know your purpose when you get close to the Holy Ghost. When you have a relationship with Him, He begins to point you, okay, go in this direction, go in this direction, because that is why you are on earth. Only Him can tell you, what is your purpose? I want us to have that desire not to just live. Life is not all about coming to school and just getting a degree and then just getting money. What is your purpose? Because actually, most of us are in Russia. If I ask you, was it the will of God for you to come to Russia? Some of you say, uh, I don't know. Um, well, there was an opening and I just came. But then we are Christians. Our lives are not supposed to be that way. For example, we are supposed to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And then we discuss with the Holy Spirit. And then we know the Holy Spirit tells us, give us divine direction. Okay, go to Russia, get a first degree. After that, wait for two years, get a second degree, a master's degree. After that, get a job, and then your wife is going to be in this country, get married, and then I'm going to show you where you get to earth. And then do this, do this, do this, and then you can come home and rest with your father. That's the life of a Christian. What's the difference with the life of a non-believer? What's the difference? Who are you? Why are you here? Why? Let's begin to, I don't know why, I just, I just don't want to live a normal life. I just don't want to live a natural life like anybody. There are some people you just see on the street, you just know that these people, they're just useless. They don't have any aim, they don't have any direction. Who are you? Look at your life. Do you have a purpose? Do you have a purpose? Do you have an aim? Why did you come here? I just want us to begin to ask ourselves those questions. And we need to say, Holy Ghost, I want to go closer and closer to you because it's only by you that I can know my purpose. And I don't just want to live a natural life. Oh, who are we? What are we doing here? Why did we come here? Why are we not in hell? Or in heaven? What are we doing on earth? Are we just living? That was a burden on my head. We need to say, oh God, I don't want to just live. I want to know my purpose. Oh God, reveal my purpose unto me. 